Welcome back to the American College of Surgeons Bulletin Brief from the Front Lines, Surgeons Voices. With me today is my dear friend, Dr. Raul Rosenthal, also my next door neighbor here at Cleveland Clinic, Florida, on the other side of the wall. Uh, Raul is our chair of our Digestive Disease Institute for the region, for the Florida region, head of general surgery at Cleveland Clinic, Florida, and also our residency program director for our general surgery program here at Cleveland Clinic, Florida. Welcome, Raul. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Thank you for hiring me here 21 years ago and for giving me today the opportunity to, to, to do this interview with the, with the college. Well, thanks. We, we've shared a lot of wonderful times over the years building uh, programs here at Cleveland Clinic, Florida and, and working together. And you certainly have uh, many accolades and, and many people know you for your prowess in bariatric surgery as past president of the American Society of Metabolic and Bariatric Surgeons, as the editor-in-chief of Surgery for Obesity and Related Disorders, and, and many other positions which you've held running the Fellowship Council with, with the International Federation for Surgery for Obesity and so on and so forth. I take the entire 12 minutes uh, recounting all of your accomplishments. But the one I wanted to focus on today is the cutting edge work that you've done with fluorescence imaging. Uh, and I'd like to start, if you could explain what is fluorescence imaging and perhaps a little of its history. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I personally think that fluorescence imaging after laparoscopy and ultrasonic scalpel uh, is uh, the most important advancement in surgery that will have an impact in patient's outcome. Interesting wise, um, the technology has been around for a long time. In fact, ICG, which is the most common dye that it's used to highlight uh, tissues or structures by using fluorescent imaging was approved by FDA, by FDA uh, the year I was born in 1959. And during the second world war it was used for photography and then the Mayo Clinic introduced it in 1961 for uh, an angiography of the eye of the retina. Uh, then it was used for liver function and then it went to sleep until the optoelectronic revolution happened with laparoscopy um, and it came back. Nowadays, uh, fluorescent imaging is, I would say, incorporated in most endoscopic uh, units, regardless of uh, the company that you choose to work with. It is incorporated to the robotic system. And the concept is to shine uh, an electromagnetic a wave, in this case, uh, near infrared light um, to a tissue. It excites the tissue and that's called excitation wave. Uh, usually it's in the 700, 600 uh, uh, nanometers wavelength. And then what you receive back to your eye is the emission. That's the emission of the tissue. Uh, it could be the biliary tree when you do laparoscopic or cystectomy. It could be a perfusion angiogram of the colon, uh, or it could be also a perfusion angiogram of a flap when you do a mastectomy, and that comes back to your eye. Um, so it allows you to see structures that you could otherwise not see with your eye if you excite the tissue with white light alone. So uh, it is revolutionary because again, it allows you to prevent uh, for instance, in the biliary tree to injure the common bile duct, uh, it allows you to prevent of injuring vessels or even recognize those vessels. You can recognize if there are areas of ischemia where you cannot uh, do a proper anastomosis and have complications after. Thanks a lot. You've mentioned a couple of areas where ICG might be useful and, and, and the mechanisms of action. So, so let's start with, I believe, the first one that you kind of described a bit in detail, and that's biliary anatomy uh, and enhancing visualization during cholecystectomy. You've done a couple of studies in this area, some very high quality studies. Uh, one I seem to recall where medical students were looking at anatomy and another one which was a randomized controlled trial um, something I seem to recall from animals. Can, can you tell us a little about those studies and what you found? Yeah. Um, so we conducted a, a 
multi multi institutional international prospective randomized control study comparing ICG cholangiography and white light versus IC, versus white light alone when doing laparoscopic cholecystectomies. And what we could show with that study, which is was published in the Annals of Surgery at uh, the beginning of 2020, uh, was that uh, no matter which structure of the BW3 you try to visualize, you can see better before and after dissection when using combined white light and infrared light than when you use white light alone. Um, so not only you could see everything better, which was the goal of the study, but we also found that the group that used white light alone had two common bile duct injuries versus the group that used white light and infrared light had no injuries. Now, it wasn't powered enough to demonstrate that uh, you decrease the number of bile duct injuries, which should be one of our goals. Uh, for that purpose, we are currently uh, in the process of implementing uh, a Cleveland Clinic study that is gonna take five years, probably 4,000 patients will, will have to incorporate into this study to be properly powered to demonstrate that we have less common bile duct injuries if we use new infrared light and ICG cholangiography instead of white light alone. Other studies uh, that we've conducted was with medical students, with residents and fellows trying to see if they could visualize better structures. And it was highly significant. This was published in surgical endoscopy in 2019 that you can see much, much better all the biliary tree structures when you use near infrared cholangiography. What is very important here is that you can see the structures, be the biliary tree, be the colon, be the vessels, be the lungs before you dissect. Uh, and if you can see a structure before you dissect, then by definition, you are preventing to create damage in that area, or you are more careful when dissecting in that area. Um, so I think this is a very, very strong argument why surgeons should be using the infrared light and fluorescent imaging routinely. It's like driving a car at night without having your headlights on. Um, it's so important to have it on all the time. And now the, the, the new technology gives you that so-called dual image where you can use near infrared and white light at the same time. So you're operating on the binary tree and at all times in green color, you see the bile duct. Yeah, that's fascinating uh, and sounds very compelling. Do you have any idea uh, on what the practice patterns have been over the last few years for uh, ICG during the biliary operations? Well, it is not yet standard of care because as I mentioned before, there is no level one evidence study that uh, can be used to that purpose. Uh, but I would say uh, that in 2021, at least in the United States of America, I would say that 20 to 30% of surgeons are now routinely using fluorescent image uh, when they do colorectal surgery or biliary tree surgery. Uh, it's being used more and more often in reoperative surgery of the foregut. Definitely, uh, I would say even a standard of care using fluorescent imaging when doing uh, breast reconstruction, tram flaps to see um, you know, the, the blood supply to the flap. Um, I'm not sure if it's standard of care, but it's routinely used by, by most plastic surgeons and breast oncologists. Okay, so certainly use to look at flaps you mentioned, uh, colorectal surgery you mentioned, and uh, maybe you could give us a little details. I mean, I, I had participated in the, in the Pillar 2 trial, which was just proving that it could be done. The, the Pillar 3 trial, I was just presented in, in podium format, uh, did not show in randomized control trial that there was a difference. However, the uh, study groups were supposed to be between the control and the treatment arm, uh, a minimum 450 patients, and it was actually powered to go up to 1,000 patients. And I, and I think it was something like perhaps 350 patients presented. So I, I don't know exactly what that means. Um, but maybe you can talk a little bit about some of the perfusion studies, whether it's liver perfusion or colorectal perfusion. Yeah, when it comes to hepatobiliary surgery, uh, in France, for instance, I've been Juif, Bismuth, and his group are using it for liver transplants. Uh, usually the transplant surgeon, the, the, I mean, the key of the transplant 
uh, is the hepatic artery. If that anastomosis works, everything else will work. And they've been uh, using it to prove that there is good blood flow to the graft. Uh, it's also being used uh, by liver surgeons in the Asian Pacific region routinely, not only to do segmentation when they do liver resections, but also to identify tumors. So they will inject the ICG even two days before the surgery. So the tumor will absorb the ICG, but because of their architecture is not organized, it cannot get rid of it. So you come back two days later, the whole liver is clean, but the tumors, when you shine infrared light, will shine. So um, it is very commonly used in the Asian Pacific for liver surgery, not only for a proper segmentation where you can see uh, the different vascularity, identify the portal vein, uh, the hepatic vein, the hepatic artery when you do your resection, but also to see the tumors. And the liver has another property, which is excretion. You can see the bile duct. So when operating on the liver, fluorescent imaging offers you many, many, many advantages. Thanks very much. Um, so you mentioned perfusion. You, you spoke about liver a little bit. How about parathyroids? Well, um, the head and neck is very peculiar because one of the things that we found out uh, working with Fernando Deep uh, from Argentina was that uh, you can use it routinely when doing thyroid surgery. It allows you to see the parathyroids because the parathyroids are unique. They autofluoresce. So you don't need to inject any ICG. For all other purposes, you need near infrared light and ICG. For the parathyroid, you just need the near infrared light and they will shine. So not only it allows you to prevent, to remove those when you do a thyroidectomy, it helps you identify those when you wanna do a parathyroidectomy. And more important than that, if you take out a thyroid, and by accident, you took out one of the parathyroids, you can shine that light on the OR table. If the parathyroid is there, you can take it out and reimplant it in the sternocleidomastoid mastoid muscle. So as I mentioned at the beginning, it doesn't only help you to prevent an injury, but it helps you to intraoperatively recognize that complication and fix it. And as a consequence of autofluorescence, together with Dr. Deep, we started looking uh, into the identification of nerves. And uh, we published it in surgical endoscopy. There are two papers of ours, one in vitro, one in vivo in the small animal. Uh, we could use ultraviolet light to see the nerves. So nowadays we can see nerves. Um, and the first, first human experience uh, is currently under review also in the peer review journal with our first 17 cases where you can see dura madre, you can see peripheral nerves, you can see the recurrent laryngeal nerve. The imaging of the nerves in surgery is gonna be a major, major impact. And we are talking about a market in the $2 billion uh, when it comes to complications, litigation, disability, et cetera, et cetera. So being able to see nerves as a colorectal surgeon, when you do a low anterior resection, as a urologist, when you do a prostatectomy, even the cardiac surgeon, when they open the pericardium, they transect sometimes the phrenic nerve that results in, in, in your diaphragm being up. It's gonna have a major, major impact. There, there is work being done by other major groups using antibodies. Uh, as you know, this has to go through FDA. Uh, it's gonna be costly, it's gonna be lengthy. Uh, our, our technology that we are working on has no dyes, it autofluoresce. So the nerves can be seen without any, any need of an antibody. But again, autofluorescence, head and neck, parathyroids, recurrent laryngeal nerve. It's a big, big, big area. Uh, and you mentioned two other things. One, one was uh, preventing injury, and, and the ureter comes to mind as a colorectal surgeon. Uh, and, and I know some work has been done in that area. And, and the other you mentioned earlier were lymph nodes. And, and although there is no, to my knowledge, FDA labeling, and colorectal for lymph nodes, I, I understand that the gynecology may be used and certainly in Europe, it seems to be used for, for nodes. So what kind of information do you have uh, for us on ureters and lymph nodes? Well, for melanoma, for central lymph node biopsy, I would say that it's becoming standard that most surgeons are doing uh, excision of melanomas use ICG to identify the central lymph node basis. Uh, breast oncology has been used at the Veronese Institute in Milano routinely. 
work done uh, by the Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, combining now the near IC, the, the, fluoride, the ICG uh, with blue dye uh, and radioactive material, trying to compare uh, specificity and sensitivity. But definitely, uh, it is it is something that it's being developed. Uh, intra-abdominally, intrathoracically, for esophagectomies, for colectomies, for gastrectomies and cancer. The Asian Pacific region is really very much so uh, developing all these technologies because of the unfortunate situation that esophageal and gastric cancer is so prevalent. But definitely we're gonna be able to see uh, lymph node basins using ICG, the thoracic duct, uh, even in neonatology, they would inject ICG between the first and second toes of the babies and will allow them to see the thoracic duct uh, in kids that have congenital malformations. Um, and it allows us also for thoracic surgeons and those who, of us who do esophagectomies to identify if there is a lesion of the thoracic duct or to prevent to uh, injure the thoracic duct when, while doing your lymphadenectomy. Well, as you mentioned, it certainly seems to be an entire revolution, uh, first with laparoscopy and, and now fluorescence imaging. Um, what work is being done to get the word out besides all of these great publications, society work, or, or work with the American College of Surgeons? Well, we started a society 10 years ago, the ISFGS. I would call it, I wouldn't call it a society. We have 800 to 1,000 members yet. It's for free. Uh, we believe that we need quality information. That's what the society does. Uh, we publish a consensus statement uh, at the, in the Annals of Surgery, trying to inform everyone that these technologies are there, how to use it, when to use it. Uh, we are working with different types of societies, with surgeons, trying to educate them uh, how to get this. Now, uh, with the American College of Surgeons, the Surgical Skills Training Committee, is currently working avidly in putting together an educational course. Uh, it's gonna be virtual. It's gonna be hopefully with all the different chapters of the college, and it's gonna entail all specialties because this is being used by neurosurgeons. This is used by thoracic surgeons, general surgeons, you name it. There is no surgical specialty in 2021 that is not using and, can, and cannot have their patients benefit from using uh, fluorescent imaging guided surgery when conducting their procedures. So we hope that by the end of this year, we are gonna have this course up and running. Great, superb information today. And uh, your enthusiasm and, and passion for it are certainly very evident. Uh, I, I imagine after listening to and watching you today, people who don't know about it may do some more reading and I know we're offering some information to our viewers today as to where some of these publications of yours can be found. So I'd like to thank you for your time and your expertise, your, your, your passion, uh, and especially for the opportunity to work together for the last 21 years. <laughs> thank you, Steve. Have a good weekend. Thank you, everyone.